Welcome, everybody. My name's Nella Thamelios. I'm one of the curators uh, at Design Hub. This is my colleague, Kate Rhodes. We wanted to welcome you here today for the first in the All the Jewelry workshops. But I want to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the original custodians on the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, as I said, this is the first in the All the Jewelry workshops, the first of 13 that will continue over the next um, weekly over the next few weeks um, and that take Lisa's exhibition as a kind of leaping off point. Thanks, Nella. So, as Nella said, really what's at the heart of Lisa's practice, we think, is this interest in querying what is jewellery, its materials, its techniques, its methods, and we use that as a leaping off point for this show, All the Jewellery, and it's an exhibition that takes the form of a series of workshops. Uh, as Nella said, this is the first. We hope you come back for the next 13 weeks for all of them, and to understand more of the who, what, why of contemporary jewellery making today. They're going to take multiple forms. There'll be panel discussions, workshops, a seance. It should be good, so keep coming back. Um, we are very excited to have Lisa Walker here as the instigator, really, of this exhibition. We've taken a note out of her book, and it's this book that we're going to walk through today with her when she leads us around the first question, how do we work conceptually? And to help us answer that, we have Bin, Blanche, Anna, Kevin, Natalia, Miles, and Simone up at the table to make, along with all of you, and you're all going to be making today, so make sure you've got space around you, uh, you're close to the materials, and to um, hear from Lisa about, well, we'll find out. But we're aiming to tackle this question. The, ex the aim of all the jewellery is not to answer these questions, but to unpack them, to activate them, and to revel in, in the importance of the as yet unknown. So, thank you all. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. This is an unusual situation. <laughs> um, so, what I am going to introduce now is actually not just for everyone at the table here, um, but everyone in the audience too is welcome to uh, be involved. So what we'll be doing is making a lot of things um, on this table here. Are all the materials you can use. Uh, we'll be cutting, joining, folding, drawing, using colour, um, with whatever materials you can find there. There's also tools here. Um, there's pens and pliers and scissors and even a guillotine. There's a, a stack of boards here that you guys can have to put on your lap to make things on. You have to make very, very quickly. You have to get really stressed. I want stress. <laughs> you have to work instinctively. Um, I want to see a lot of things that you've made. Um, yeah, if, if you sort of get a bit stuck, don't worry, put it aside, move on to the next. Attack your materials, be nice or nasty, polite or rude, talk to them, don't be afraid of them. You're the boss, but also let them talk to you. Uh, make jewelry pieces if you like, but you don't have to. It's up to you, and feel free to talk as well, and that's all I'm going to say for now. Help yourselves.
Speculator. Alrighty, should we have a wee chat before everyone goes? Panel, are you listening? <laughs> Any observations about the title of the workshop? Any um, from what you experienced today, what you heard a little bit from other people? I got a thought. <laughs> Good. Um, I thought that the for me, when I was making my pieces, I didn't feel like there was a cons like it wasn't about being conceptual. It was about responding to materials mm. and their properties, and what I could do in a very improvised, you know, quick making way. And then, after I'd made it, then I worked out what it was mm -hmm. from a conceptual point of view. If that makes sense. So it was sort of the materials drove me first, and then. I thought about what it was that I'd done. And you sort of start by with this pile of materials, and so you can run into something, and then when materials get scarce, suddenly you think really <laughs> differently about them. And you kind of go, oh, maybe I'll unwind that thing that I just <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, sort of, um, I had the same thing, looking at materials and them just see, them naturally lending themselves to certain... Um, of shapes, like I mean, obviously a rope. First thing I thought is a noose, um, cable tie. It wouldn't occur to me to do anything other than tie them and pull them to the end because that's what a cable tie does. Mm. So it's sort of just like the natural, um, like it's almost like entropy. Like the final state of the material is always going to be what what it ends up as. You know, wire is kind of it's just going to get crinkled and. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yep. Do you think that's a contrast to working conceptually? Because it's hard to think that, for instance, you'd you know, run out of a concept. Mm. You know, that concepts seem to be things that are always being reformed and yeah. innovated and, and so on, which maybe is kind of sometimes an issue. Mm. This seems to be uh, kind of at the antithesis of that, uh, in the sense that it's uh, rare materials that mm we scavenge and put together. Mm. Yeah, for sure. But also, I mean, the materials themselves, they, on their own, they already tell a, a story. It's sort of just trying to put them into a shape that that story, because it, whenever I look at anything on that table, it automatically said something, like obviously a rope, 
and you know how to tie one knot, and it's not because you know, but also the fact that I'm gay and indigenous. A lot of my ancestors actually had nooses around their their neck, and a lot of people that was the first thing, last thing they wore around their neck before they died, and so it kind of automatically lends its. You just look at the rope and think, oh. I mean that that is con conceptual, but it's also the kind of obvious to me the obvious state for the rope to be in. Am I on? No. That um, it's very hard to look at materials without seeing the embedded narrative yeah. and the baggage in them. And so I think, ironically, we are all demonstrating what we understand and know of materials. Mm. There's very little new knowledge that's been generated around this table, I think, around the materials. So we are sort of showing what we know. We are working with them in ways that we understand and know. And perhaps a lot of materials based practice, though is about trying to learn more from materials. Because, um, uh, you know, they all come with their baggage and their history and I immediately think about industrial processes and standardisation and how materials are used in a, you know, in mass production and reproduction. So I'm looking at what I've created and I go, yep, so predictable. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm looking at what Blanche is producing and I can see your repeat patterns and I see all your, all your model making, mm -hmm. ironically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see the same with Bin. So it's, it's haven't seen a lot of Kevin's jewellery lately, so <laughs> this is a total surprise. It'll be in production next week at the NGV <laughs> shop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. But so, I think with, can I just say with Kevin's, it, it, it um, struck me that... Kevin's the wordsmith amongst most of us, I think, and he has applied words onto his piece. And I think that, you know, that's like you were saying, you know, you bring what you know, and there are the words. Well, you can look at, you know, language, syntax, and so on as mm. a, sort of a linking of, of elements that maybe has a jewellery component mm. uh, to it. And this is a way of. Uh, Understanding the materiality of language in that sense as something you form. But but I, I really loved, I mean, I was interested to see what you would do because I know you're not a maker, but I loved all the load of information that you gave me in those, what, three minutes of chatting to your, the, the materials that you'd chosen and then how you'd, why you put them together and what, where they then shot off to. Oh, it well, was I quite amazing. We underestimate <laughs> the material, materiality of, of language. Mm. You know, we've taken for yes, granted it's all, that, that it's sort books, of the same, actually. That it's books all the same. are a natural home for language, but now that we can read on phones or any other device, you know, the actual materiality of the book as a thing is becoming more important mm -hmm. to us. A bit like vinyl records for music, and that you know, words, ideas need a home. Um, you know, they need some sort of object like a memento or a love token or something that they can live inside. Yeah, it's like the Japanese concept of the kami that has to inhabit. So you're going the world. off again. It's so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so also from here, I love it. It's but I was I was very curious about yours, Miles. That uh, you joked about it being kind of high vis, and I guess that's one of the interesting strains of jewelry because it's usually seen as gendered. That it's um, uh, more specific to what for femininity and the masculinity, but I wonder sometimes whether high vis is a kind of ornament. Yeah, it's for become sure. part of our, even though we, we read it perhaps practically, mm. but um, uh, that a bit like the way S Susan Con refashioned technology to be ornament, mm. whether there's a, a way of refashioning high vis. But it's, also, it's not just gendered, it's also like deeply kind of class-based, is high-vis. I remember, you know, going to school, having people saying, oh, I never want to have to wear high-vis. And it's like this idea that, I don't know, high-vis is this kind of social marker. But also, I'm not sure that jewellery is gendered. I mean, in the West it is, but I wouldn't say it is all around the world. It's sort of just the human desire to adorn yourself. And I think of the kind of birds of paradise and the... the kind of biomimicry in the highlands and the PNG with the amazing feather headdresses and the nose ornaments and this kind of incredible display of kind of both machismo and also like f extreme flamboyancy and like mimicking the birds with 
amazing adornment. It's kind of, that's a very male ceremony. Mm. Mm. And also, I love wearing necklaces. <laughs> he does. <laughs> I would say that um, with materials, you have a visual language, so as well as a written language, you have a material language. And using materials in different ways, you're translating ideas from one form to another. So you might be translating ideas that are written into ideas that are made. And uh, also, uh, like I was talking to Bin as I was making that, and she said, oh, this is like a Christmas cracker. And it's like, to me, it's nothing like a Christmas cracker. So it's a way of connecting with people. Mm. One person sees something in something that you've made that is not the first thing I thought of, and it wasn't important to me. Mm. But you have that new connection. So it's like a period of translation where someone else gets it, and you're, you're really communicating with objects. So yeah. for me, that's... A, a great motivator to keep on making jewellery, this potential to keep on communicating with other people with, with visual language rather than spoken words. Mm -hmm. I think the beauty of jewellery as well is that it's not just a visual language, it's actually a tactile language as well. So you've got that ability to communicate bodily through, you know, the person, the wearing of the jewellery. There are, you know, there's a communication between the maker and the wearer and the wearer and the observer, anyone who's mm -hmm. observing someone. So... Yeah. And activating the senses. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but um, Anna, your your work's very theatrical. This piece. <laughs> well, <laughs> generally, you know, you've had your, your dioramas and yes. so on, and this is a you had Kate wearing the piece before. Yes. Um, and a lot in terms of customary mm. objects or jewelry, often it's tied to ceremony and it doesn't really have value, you know, before or after the ceremony. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, whether for you, there is a, a realm of jewellery which can be like that. A bit like the masked ball, you know, where you have this object that you might take out for a particular occasion. Yes, yeah, so I guess well, with the work with the diorama, that, that the, the work, it, it exists and they are objects, but, but actually being able to kind of um, to play around with them and to give the object some agency, it kind of it extends that... that Oh, I don't know, that ability, that connection with objects. and So that, that's why I do it, and so that people can tell stories with objects. So narrative is very important to, to what I do, and that's you know, obviously without words as well. But um, it's about, for me, it's about engagement. And the objects, I guess, when they're not being... I mean, they're all in boxes in my studio at the moment, that big diorama. But, um, yeah, it's like, yeah, that they, that they have a life, but they need an agency that's provided by a person to actually bring that, bring the objects to life. And I wonder, Lisa, you know, we've all, most of us anyway, have uh, seen over the summer how the Marie Kondo method of decluttering <laughs> has become oh, popular and so you, must, you must thank the object. The piece coming. You must thank the object that you let go uh, into <laughs> your big plastic bin or whatever. But I'm wondering, do you ever feel that I you haven't should seen this series, ask permission the of the <laughs> objects before you make them jewellery? Do you ever... <laughs> Sorry, say that again? Do you feel you ever have to ask permission of the objects before you make them jewellery when you ask string them up? Ask permission of them. Do you feel any kind of... May or give them a be new with life? the punamu, perhaps? Yes. Uh -huh. Is that asking permission of the material? No, more of myself, actually. So maybe, no, I haven't, perhaps, is the answer to that. Mm. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, when there's an object rights association, nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the oh, consent? Oh, you're talking about oh. copyright and things. That's no, another. No, no, no. I wonder, that is, mm. that's another story. Mm. Yeah, no, yeah, yes. permission, other people. I, I have asked other people permission before. Right. And there's an acknowledgement that I have to deal with, how I deal with the acknowledgement of an object mm -hmm. or who made it or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's a great deal of sense in that, Kevin, because most of the materials here on this table have been manufactured. Mm. So, um, you know, there's an ecology here of material making that perhaps we're not interrogating and there's a whole big system out there that needs a complete rehaul. Mm. You know, it's delivering a, uh, an environment, a life that many of us find deeply problematic. And so, hence, you know, it, 
won't be too far into the distant future where we will perhaps completely orientate ourselves differently towards materials. And so, you know, most of us have been working with, you know, kind of materials mm. here that haven't been formed into, you know, an object that's taken that next level of manufacture. But, um, you know, perhaps we won't be crinkling up and ripping up paper like that into yeah. the future. It really does express where we're at at this present time with our value system. And perhaps that's also something to think about and interrogate. Mm. Yeah? For sure. Mm. It's funny the way our objects kind of hold us hostage, though, because you kind of, I don't know, you think that when these were materials, they didn't really mean anything, but we've all spent time with them and we've changed them and we've embedded them with some sort of emotional or spiritual or whatever it is in something we've charged them in some way and now they have more many I like I would feel slightly sadder to just throw this in the bin than I would have before I made it you know <laughs> the, the materials it's the kind of the time you spend with something and um, I mean I just think about that in my house like how um yeah, my, my friend Gail, she's like this crazy French woman, she's amazing. And she um, said that there was this saying her mother used to say to her, she had this beautiful 19th century champagne glass in her house and she'd had it in her family for a long time and she dropped it and she burst into tears and I said, it's all right, it's just a glass. And she said, yes, but it broke on my watch. And she said it had lasted so long in this universe. And I said, yes, but it's entropy, things break. She says, yes, but it broke on my watch. And I just thought, that's <laughs> so kind of powerful to think of how, yeah, um, how much we are held hostage by the things around us. But that, that's interesting in terms of, if that had been a new glass that came from Kmart or somewhere, mm. It still would have broken on her watch, mm. but it wouldn't have mattered no. nearly as much. And because the object carries its history yes. and the connections with family or whatever it might be, it's those things that are the precious bit, yeah. not the glass thing. Yeah. But Ben, I want to propose to you that that glass from Kmart that broke on your watch is just as important. Because don't we have a sense of responsibility to the world and to resources and to manufacture? But and maybe to it's not emotional. But, I, the, but we yeah. should get emotional about these things. And I think it's that disconnect with objects that don't bear the sentimental relationship mm -hmm. that we are perhaps, you know, to our detriment not caring for yep. mm. and not understanding and that everything... And it's about replace everything. replaceability because that glass she broke... That was, you know, yeah. 200 years old, is not replaceable to her. But you have the idea in your mind that the glass from Kmart is replaceable. But that sort of says so much about the disposable nature of how yeah, we, exactly. we interface with the, mm -hmm. our world, mm -hmm. that we don't value, or we just think it's, it's something is replaceable when... It's, um, like, it's like that question about the grandfather's axe, yeah. You've got this sentimental yeah. grandfather's yep. axe. Yep. The handle breaks, you replace the handle. Eventually, the head breaks, you replace the head. Is it still yeah. your grandfather's, your grandfather's axe? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that, that imbued spirit mm. in the object, which it's a vessel for carrying that spirit. And at yeah. what point have you lost the spirit? Mm. Yeah, I agree. Because I think I've always been suspicious how we do prize objects which are made by hand or made by individuals over objects that do come through in industrial production. And yes, we exercise values about, you know, what's perhaps more precious or um, we go to, you know, but we know who made it, etc. And I think that's all valid. But I really do think that we also just reorientate a little bit to understand that, you know, we're not all complacent in understanding that uh, we can shift and change the way we think more broadly about the other system. Because um, unless we do start caring mm. about that, we will get the world where we're talking more and more and more about how deeply problematic our relationship is to materials. When I heard that story that Miles was saying because it's about glass and I use a lot of glass, I was thinking how great that even though that was such a special piece, it was still being used, it mm. wasn't put away in a cupboard. Yeah. And um, that's the risk you take whenever you use anything, yeah. that it, it might break yeah. and you, 
you do it anyway. And I think that that little bit of tension makes it more special and that's a really valuable thing as well. Mm. So is, it, is, it, is its function also important? Could you sweep up the broken glass, put it in a container and is it still no. valuable? Is it still precious? Or is it the <laughs> fact that it's also, it's also <laughs> lost its function it, heartbreaking? It's, it's, it's lost its, yeah, it's Gone. lost its but function. Just a reminder of how... Isn't Careless. that like but life? <laughs> Life's fragile. But my mum bought this vase. I can walk outside tomorrow and get hit by a bus. She still has it in a box. Jewelers are doing just because she loved it. They repurposing. That's right. Like if if so you if your friend knew a, a glass maker, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, is it possible that the glass could be melted down and to become something else, and that the story actually travels through the? It wouldn't be a beautiful thing. <laughs> but it could <laughs> be. <laughs> and a <laughs> oh, Probably wouldn't be. I mean, and with that last you can't put the poo back in the phone. Um, I just want to say thanks, everyone. It's been really wonderful seeing what everyone made and, it's, and chats towards the end. Um, yeah, I find, always find it quite remarkable, the individualness of it, even though we had sort of a limited array of material, such special, mm. wonderful things come out. And, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.